Next, we talk project risk management. Now, for those of you who have been listening to these lectures, you know I've talked about risk management a lot. I've mentioned it in reference to other knowledge areas and other processes in which it is important to. Now we'll do a deep dive on this knowledge area of risk. There are seven different processes that we've identified as part of this knowledge area. We plan risk management, we identify the risks, we perform qualitative risk analysis, and we perform quantitative risk analysis. We plan the risk response, and new to this particular version is implement risk response. And then we control risks. We look at that in our process group of monitoring and controlling everything that's happening, risk being one of the factors that we want to look at and make sure we keep an eye on because risk is our, risks are the things that might happen, good or bad. Planning, risk management. Our inputs include the project management plan, our project charter, our stakeholder register, our enterprise environmental factors, our organizational process assets. We use the tools of analytic techniques, of expert judgment, of meetings, and we come up with a risk management plan. Now, there are no risks identified yet. This process is simply to put together the plan for how we will identify, manage, analyze, etc. All the risks that may come up during our project and as our project goes forward. The risk management plan, it contains a methodology. How are we going to do this? It should be something that's written um, in a sense of a step-by-step, -step, um, having some idea of what we look for in risks. How do we define it? Where are we going for it, etc. Our categories are listed, and we'll note some of these categories of where risk can be noted. And the categories are not just used as part of the plan, but we actually use those as part of the risk register where we are tracking those risks and doing our real risk management business, if you will. The probabilities and impact definitions should be part of the methodology, so we understand how we were looking at the risks specifically about the probability. Do we think it's very likely? Not so likely. How do we feel? If I say very likely or not so likely, what do I mean? Are there specifics that we can give into this methodology that will help us be more successful in managing risk? We'll also look at the stakeholders' risk tolerance. Now, a risk tolerance is a very important thing to understand. We all have one. If you have a lot of life insurance because you're scared that something will happen and your family may not be taken care of, you may be viewed as having a not so high risk tolerance. You may be, you don't like risk very much. You don't tolerate the risks out there. As opposed to somebody who carries no life insurance which may be a very risky kind of behavior. And the tolerance levels affect and show up in the behavior of the person. Now, life insurance has nothing to do with business. So this example is a, a behavior we all share or we all share the possibility of so we can understand it. In business, Risk tolerances differ according to what your role is, what your background is, and your general disposition. Some companies, a risk tolerant person is not put in certain positions because they tolerate too much risk and therefore bring on too much risk to the company. It's been said that project managers tend to be risk adverse. They don't like risk. And I laughed at it the first time I heard it 
until I started thinking about it. I, I don't believe it's particularly true because there are things that we must do as project managers that could invite some risk into the project. Because being successful in delivering a project sometimes has risk involved. It's calculated risk. It's figuring out what the possibilities are, what the impacts are. All projects have risk, and all risk is dealt with in one way or another. What we'll look at here in the plan is the tolerances of our stakeholders so we have an understanding of how best to communicate with them what questions to ask them so that we can get an understanding of the things that they think might happen that could adversely affect the project, as well as looking at the opportunities that could be created by the project. Because risk is the unknowns, and we have both positive and negative unknowns. We don't want to ignore the possibilities that a thing we haven't thought about or we have thought about that possibly could have or happen, that that thing might help us in the future be more successful, either within our specific project or just within our organization. Some of these risks we act on actively. That's part of the plan. Some of them we act on um, and pass on to other organizations that are more appropriate to working on the risk or the mitigation strategies. And we'll talk about the different definitions here. For the plan, the content of the plan, we need to understand, uh, under, have an understanding of the risk tolerance of our stakeholders. We also need to know how we are reporting and tracking the risks and, and the, re the requirements, excuse me, how we are looking at the requirements and then we need to understand how that will relate into the risks because the requirements are what we're doing the risks will fold into that because what we were are doing will directly re relate to what might happen which is what the risks are about we'll do the roles and responsibilities and budgeting as part of our plan who does what who gathers the risks, who builds the plan of how to mitigate, who does the responses, are there different responses for different risks and do different people have responsibility for that? And the budgeting, where's the money coming from? We've talked about this reserve analysis and we'll go into more detail about that. In brief, in the budgeting piece, we'll look at how we come up with that and will roll that number, those numbers, both in terms of dollars and time for the schedule into our other baseline reports. As we've talked about previously, here's where we would plan on how that would happen and get agreement from the stakeholders and the sponsor about those monies. It's just not creating a bucket, a generic bucket of money and time that we could use in case something goes wrong. We might start there just as a placeholder as we look at estimating. Is it a highly risky project or a low risk project? If it's highly risky, our, our uh, first pass at the budget, how much money and how much time it might take, might be higher than if it's a low risk project. And that can be demonstrated and documented in the project charter, the first drafts of the project management plan if we haven't done heavy risk analysis. Remember, we can only do so many things at once and we're putting together things that look sequential at first glance that really are happening, happening concurrently. That's why we keep checking back at, at things. The early planning stages of a project have a lot of concurrent plans going at the same time, cr being created at the same time because they affect each other. The same stakeholders are generally in all of these efforts. So we have to keep a mind to that as we look at this material. 
The timing of our risk is also a big piece. We need to know both how much time, effort, and the timing of when we would actually uh, look at risk, when we would check on risk, how we would coordinate our risk management efforts, our risk responses, our risk analysis efforts. So those things would be noted in our, our risk management plan. Here's a component of the risk breakdown structure. Again, this is a hierarchical chart, and we see that we've broken this project, and I have a generic project here, and we've broken it into components. We have risks in different places. We have IT risks, and we've broken it into, we might have a IT development risks place, system risks, testing risks and they're numbered so that we can uniquely identify the risks that we come up with and we can keep track of them so we know what our analysis is and what our response is and if we have to execute that response we can track that as well. But this just breaks the types of risk we think may, might happen. Now will there always be a risk associated with any one of these categories? Not necessarily. Right now, we're looking at this in a generic way. Your project may be very much more specific, and you may have documents from other projects that show this in a greater level of detail that is more helpful to you. But realize it's always a good practice to look at a generic view rather than diving into specifics too early. Because if we're too early in getting into the specifics, you may miss some of the bigger categories that need to be addressed or need to be taken into account, especially when you're dealing with planning something that may or may not happen. Risk is not definite. The concept of risk is but any single risk occurring is by definition not certain. And managing the uncertainty of risk is one of the challenges that we have. You'll note we've got some detail in our chart here of external, internal, project management, IT. All of these can be separated and broken down. So, Think about how it makes sense with your project. If you don't have an IT component, then you wouldn't have this as part of your structure. You probably have a project management component because we are talking project management here. So we're assuming that the project has someone managing it yourself or someone else if you're looking at this. And note the three components we put in this risk breakdown structure. Very simply, we looked at the triple constraint and said each of those components had potential for having individual risks. And we might break these out into multiple risks under schedule, under budget, under scope. Now we're going to identify risks. The inputs here are risk management plan and our cost management plan, our schedule management plan, our quality management plan, our resource management plan, our scope baseline, our activity cost estimates, our activity duration estimates, our stakeholder register, our project documents, our procurement documents, if they exist, if we are procuring items, our enterprise environmental factors and our organizational process assets. Now, there's a lot of inputs. That's why risk is looked at kind of towards the end of this, even though we reference it earlier in our discussions, because it's related and we pull information. Every time we look at documents or create a new plan. These plans, these baselines, these estimates 
those can be looked at and examined for potential risks so we can identify. Hence, they are the inputs to identifying risk. We look at document reviews as one of our tools. So we're looking at the, the documents, we're reading them, we're scanning them for potential things that might go wrong or right. We're looking at information gathering techniques. Not simply reading documents, but it, we, there may be interviews that we can talk to people and other ways of pulling together potential risks and identifying them so that we can mitigate or we can create a, a certain response plan after our analysis is done. We have a checklist analysis. A lot of times we have a lot of checklists and projects. It depends on the type of project, the industry, and how it's been done in the past. If you're doing a project that is has a lot of history of prior projects, such as you are doing a new version of an existing software. So it's instead of version two, you're going to version three. Or if you're doing a new product rollout, that the product already exists, but we're enhancing the product and we're bringing out the newest version, then a checklist may exist in that original development and rollout production type of, of, of effort. If it does, it's a good place to look and see if it is valid, if it has issues, if it had risks, if there's something there that might identify a risk moving forward. We're not moving backwards, we're trying to establish if there are things that might happen forward. We may have assumption analysis, one of the greatest place to look for risks. If you have captured assumptions in your charter, in any other documentation that you've done, you take that assumption, any single assumption, and if the assumption is turned on its head, so to speak, if I assume that the fiscal year will not affect my current budget, well, the new fiscal year coming in, if it does, it becomes a risk to your project. If you assume that the government is going to have their budget approved on time so that there are no potential government shutdowns of any agencies or services, then if you're dependent on government services or agencies for your project, and that assumption does not come through, it represents a risk, and it can be noted as such. Just because something is not in the assumptions group doesn't mean it can't be a risk. And just because something's a risk doesn't mean that you necessarily have an assumption. But this is where we're wor working concurrent documents in real time. You might think of something as a risk that you have to re go back to other documentation and say, we're going to add an assumption here. Because we think that there's a likelihood high enough for us to be concerned that this event may occur. So we want to assume that it won't over here. So when someone's looking at one set of documents, it's consistent with another set. It's just, it's bookkeeping, if you will, but it's the best kind of bookkeeping back and forth to make sure that you have a consistent view. And it doesn't take long. We're not talking about hiring someone to do all this work. It shouldn't take long as long as you have consistent processes about how you deal with documentation. We talked about that in the lecture on communication. In communication management, we deal with the fact that documents may change and we need consistent ways of changing them, adapting them, and moving forward. We also have diagramming techniques, which will show you several diagramming techniques that help lead us to the idea of what might happen in various scenarios over our project. A lot of, of risk management doesn't get done in smaller projects or with certain organizations because they view this as it's 
not going to happen, or if it does happen, we'll deal with it when it's real, because risk is dealing with the what ifs. Diagramming techniques are a good way of formally looking at the what ifs, and it helps get, give you some concrete examples you can hold on to and help generate the, the good effort and good feelings and support of risk management in your management staff, in your executives, your stakeholders, your sponsors, everyone. We also use a technique called the SWOT analysis, and we'll go into detail about that. Expert judgment is also used, of course. You are the experts. We bring in experts. We use their opinion and their expertise. The outputs is the risk register. It's the first major output of the risk management after we've created the plan. We create the plan, we've designed the risk reg register so that we know what items are in there, what information it contains, the format, the structure. Now we identify risk, the risk register is now populated. It starts having items in it. Now risks defined. When you look at risk, we have threats. As I said, there are things that could happen that are negative. Threats are negative risks. So if you look at risk and you think of the threats to your project, those are negative risks. They haven't happened yet. A risk is not happening. A risk may occur. Why am I saying it that way? Because we get confused sometimes and we call events that have happened a risk. If it's happened, it's an issue and we treat it differently. Now we may, if it was something we had planned for, we do use the tools in the risk register and our risk management methodologies to have hopefully already created a response and we merely use the risk register to launch that response. We use our methodologies to know what the triggers are and who and when and how much we have already stated and planned for. Now, it may not be that our risk response is, is valid because this hasn't happened yet. So when it, it does happen and it becomes an issue, we do need to look back and make sure our analysis was complete and accurate, and we'll talk about that. Threats, negative risks. Then we have opportunities. I've mentioned this a couple of times in different spaces, and opportunities are the positive risks. There's the things that might happen that actually could be good for the company or good for the project. For instance, it's an opportunity that we may want to note that every year our vendor at the end of their fiscal year gives us a break on our general billing so that we may recoup 10% of our billing costs in the last quarter of the year. May, it may happen, it may not, but if it's historically something that has happened, we might note that, that we could get a little bit of a boost in our budget in the last fiscal quarter either of the vendor or ours, depending on how it's defined, how you're defining it. Discover real facts that have historical consequence and significance, and then note them and look at them. Is this something that will hurt us or help us? If it will help you, it's an opportunity. If it will hurt you, it's a threat. Now, the risk register I have in front of you, this is a risk register. It, it's just a a generic one. You would not necessarily have all the categories, though I would say this is fairly standard material. You have ID, a unique ID. Is It is very important that you have a unique ID. That way you can track your risks specifically, refer to them specifically, and communicate about them specifically. You have the risk noted, and here we have a very general title. 
You might add a more detailed description as needed. Just add another column and put it in there. You might have budget reduction, but you want more information. And that can be hidden. Certain tools have the ability to hide information, though you can see that it's there, you don't see all the information. Those of you who work with these tools like Excel, etc., understand that we have some flexibility and we can build tools that help us to make this clear without crowding our screens with a lot of data that may not be uh, important to all parties. But this gives us, I, I designed this particular risk register with the idea of giving us a clean look at the concept and the generally included information within the register itself. Here we have likelihood, which I've abbreviated, and impact, severity, status, owner, response, and here it, it you can put di different types of things in the um, have you done any kind of uh, mediation plans or contracted for people or have you pushed it off to someone different? We'll see how your di the different responses that we create for this will give us other information. And I've left one column over here just to say, yes, you can add more things. For the sake of presentation, this is brief. You understand you can expand this to the point that you need. The types of things that are in likelihood, here I have high, medium, and low. You could do this differently, and we'll see some charts that do it differently because there's different ways of approaching it. You can numerically look at likelihood in percentages. You can also look at impact. Well, if it's, the impact can be high, medium, and low, or it can be a dollar sign or a day's lost impact. If a vendor is late on delivering certain equipment, you could have an impact of your schedule of a day for day. So every day they're late, we're late. Or it could be if they're late a day, we're going to lose a week. The specifics are from your project and how that works. And it could be part of the contracts that you're writing with the vendors, how that kind of risk is going to be looked at and analyzed. And the likelihood, the impact, and the severity are all part of this analysis, which we'll talk about. Status here, there are no statuses. We do have owners, and we've made sure that we put the idea that you should have an owner of the risk. Does that mean that the risk is their fault? No. It means that the response to that risk, should it be realized into an issue, would fall on them to initiate the response, if not take care of the risk fully. That's information that should be in your risk management plan. What does owner mean? And you might have multiple ones. The response we'll talk about in detail. The response to the risk is what you, your analysis has shown you and your plan for how you would ideally handle it if the risk manifests itself in the way that you originally thought. Again, you may have not fully understood the likelihood or impact of a risk, and it's important that you have some flexibility, but the response gives us a first shot at it. How are we handling this risk? And you'll see some of the responses are not just passive. When it happens, I will do this. They're active. We're going to treat this as something we need to mitigate or try and avoid or try and bring on, encourage. There's lots of different ways of looking at this, and we'll talk about those differences. Now, here's one of those tools I told you about. 
SWOT analysis. You'll see in the chart, the tool, it identifies strengths and weaknesses. The strengths of your company, of your project, of your organization can show uh, the opportunities that are possible. Are you quick to market in your organization? Are you, do you have a very um, resilient workforce? Those could be strengths, and in your specific project, those strengths may help you understand some of the uh, opportunities of the project. Your weaknesses, there again, if you don't move very fast, if your company can't make decisions fast, and fast is a relative term, and it really depends on the industry, it depends on your, your organization, your project, all of the details. But if you've identified that we don't put an RFP out quickly, so if the choice to do an RFP to solve a problem is going to be made, it may take you six months, nine months to get that RFP created, generated, and put through. If that's the case and you view it as a weakness, then you need to note that that's a risk. It's a threat to the project if that piece of the project is instrumental, is essential. And here we see it. Strengths to opportunities, weaknesses to threats. It's a very simple analysis, and it's not the, thing, the type of thing to spend huge amounts of time on, but it can be a group activity where you look at this with a group of people, your stakeholders, your sponsors, your team, and you make intelligent choices about what, uh, that, where these things could be. And understand, people don't like to look at their weaknesses. They may want to focus on their strengths. But you still have to be honest with what you're doing. Only, the only way to prepare for something to go wrong is to be honest. And the only way to be ready for those opportunities that may fall in our laps is to be honest. This helps us give you a way. It's not the only way. It is a single tool that I encourage you to use for risk and the risk identification. We also have some examples of how it's used. Strengths can be fast development cycle, aggressive marketing group, senior management that grew up with social media. We might not think about some of these things in general, but if you have these kinds of, of items that you can identify, it may let you have opportunities like can keep up with the, the competition, and may set a trend to be first in a profitable niche, may predict the next big thing. If this is your profile of strengths, then the opportunities that may come up, and yes, we're talking about project management, and your project has already been defined. You're only looking here to seek ways that may help you in the future, help your uh, organization as you move forward. Likewise, if your weaknesses are inconsistent, inconsistent experience with product launch, inexperienced senior management, and dependent on new technology, then you could launch a failed product. You could overextend your working capital. You, the technology may not scale to the needs. Those are just possibilities that are out there not predicting anything. These haven't happened, but they're things to look at as you move a project into the, from the planning stage into really making it happen, working on executing it, that you better look at. If you're dealing with new technology, where's the risk tolerance of your sponsor, your C-suite? See if it matches because you don't want to come back to them and say, we can't do it after you said you could, or maybe it will affect your approach. And that's one of the things that risk 
analysis and risk management really helps us with. It helps us make choices about what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And sometimes the shouldn't do's are, are more important than the should do's. So another tool, cause and effect diagram. We've seen this before. I said we'd see it again and here it is. Here you have a cause and details from that cause. This is also called the Ishikawa diagram, fishbone diagram because of its likelihood or the, it looks like a fishbone. If you took a fish and you, here's the head and the bones going out of it all the way to the tail. And these are tools. So look at them as useful things that you can help you understand. Here, we have a problem. We have identified four possible causes and then the details. How does this help you with risk and identifying risk is that if you look at things that could happen, a problem, this might help you build the analysis of what to do about it, how to avoid it, or how to have a plan in place. If it does happen, what do I do? That's the kind of thing this kind of analysis does. It's a very useful tool. It's used in a lot of different ways with, with projects. And it's one of those I keep in my toolbox and you can throw it up on a, this, these elements can be put onto a whiteboard or use post-it notes. It's very, very easy to do. The five whys, another technique. Why are we receiving new data in this format? Here's an actual example of what we're looking at. So you ask the why, why are we, what's the problem been introduced as? If we have an issue, someone says, we have an issue, we have an, we're receiving new data in, 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 this, in a format that we're not used to. Well, why, why are we receiving it? We answer that question because that's what the data warehouse sends. Well, why do they use that format? And we answer that why, because that's what we told them to use. Well, why did we tell them to use this format? You see where we're going? Because we think it's the easiest choice. Well, why did, why did we think it was the easiest choice? Because it's the easiest format to work with manually. Ah. Why do we work with it manually? We always work files and we assumed we would work with these. The idea here in this example is that we use the technique of asking why, 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 but doing it rational and reasonably and driving the information out. Almost the word picture that comes to my mind is think about driving out quail with the hunting dogs. Now, if you don't like hunting analogies, I'll have others, but you're flushing the information out you're bringing it to the front. You're being able to see it. When you look, when you ask why a number of times, the tendency is to be able to get better information and therefore do better planning and maybe identify risks. That's what we're doing here. The five whys can be used in other methods or other areas of project management and business analysis. We use them all the time. It's a tool. And remember, we have a box of tools we're creating. Here's one of them. This is how it's used. Risk terms. Beware of risk triggers. The trigger is the, is, is the thing that allows us to know that a risk may become or is becoming an issue. The triggers are things that we are looking for actively monitoring the triggers to see if a response needs to be uh, kicked off. Or if it doesn't, then we need to keep monitoring it. 
If you had a risk that said, we believe that our, we will be over budget by the end of the fiscal year, and you've stated it for some reason, you might have a trigger that ties into your earned value management and look at your cost performance index. And if your cost performance index moves a certain direction or gets to a certain level, then that's a trigger and you would act upon it accordingly. So triggers, they can be very specific or they can be somewhat general. It really, the more specific they can get, obviously the better, but it needs to be realistic within your project. And each of the risks, it's good to try and find a trigger, even if it's a general condition that may exist. Bad press is coming out about the vendor you're concerned with. That may be a general condition, but if you've identified that vendor as a key supplier of something you need for your project, then it's a good thing to keep an eye on those press. Put a reading service note that anytime that that particular vendor is mentioned, that it pops into your email. And once a week, you look at those emails and you see, is anybody in trouble? Done it. That's something that you can do. Risk tolerance. We've talked about risk tolerance. Key term to understand how this, this works. And it, it is something that's discussed a great deal, used in case studies, etc., about you know, knowing the risk tolerances or not knowing the risk tolerances and getting in trouble because that knowledge was not gleaned before a project was kicked off. Risk averse. That's what they say some project managers are. We don't want risk. But that's the, I don't want to be in any kind of risky situation. I'm risk averse situationally. And what I mean by that is there are certain situations that I get in that I, I want to be risk averse. Driving a car, I'm risk averse. I drive safely. I drive not more than 10 miles over the speed limit, generally speaking and I try and keep my car well maintained. Now, other people drive fast, drive scary dangerous in my mind, but I'm risk averse in that situation. I'm also a contractor. I work as a contract trainer, instructor, project manager, business analyst, curriculum developer, whatever. I do things on contract basis. I'm not a full-time employee for anyone except for my own company. In that, I would be looked at as not risk averse. I would be looked at as being pretty tolerant of risk because I don't have a steady paycheck and I'm at the, the mercy of the market influences much more than if I were a full-time employee with a pension and uh, a steady office somewhere. It's different for different situations. Now, a fallback plan is something we talk about in risk because in risk, you might have to back out your system. You know, you've tried to put something in and now you can't. The fallback plan is if, if things don't go right in a certain area, how are we going to fall back to where we were before? So it's looking at how do I reverse things if we're in the process of doing it. It, w it makes perfect sense when you are de developing code or an application and you want to know how do I go back to the, the version before. Think about backups you do on your personal computers. Those are actually fallback plans, in a sense, or part of a fallback plan, in which if you have a catastrophic failure, you can go back to an earlier version of what your computer looked like. Manifest destiny, inevitable event. Uh, just note that this is a term that's sometimes used. I'm smiling because I'm used to it in, in a... Uh, a situation that's more historical and using it here there may be things that that are inevitable and they're sometimes used 
uh, and, and, and maybe given an, an example in your exam, in the certification, in which it's an inevitable event is, is talked about. And it, you may be asked, can you tell me what this is more like? And you have four selections, and one of them is manifest destiny. Watch lists. These are low priority risks that are tracked separately for the risk register. Okay, I've said the risk should all go in the risk register. A watch list is saying that, you know, we really don't think these are, are, are they're very low priority. We don't have a high impact or a high uh, probability, but we just wanna keep a list going in case someone mentions it again or situations change, we can easily move it back into the primary risk register. Well, why wouldn't you put it in the primary risk register in the main deck to begin with? Well, you don't want to clutter that. You really want to keep your communication clean, meaning the communication you have when you look at a document should have as little information as you can buy with and as much detail as you need. Moving low impact, low probability risks from the main risk register into a sub tab, okay? Think of it in tabs on an Excel spreadsheet, something like that. Separate document is possible, but the idea is you wanna make the things you look at regularly in the risk register and you work on with a great deal of vigor in a different place than possibly some other things. This is especially true when you have a very high, uh, large uh, project that you're dealing with a lot of moving pieces. You wanna unclutter it. And this is a technique for uncluttering the risk register and keeping it clean so that you can work it and make sure that the high priority, high uh, impact kind of items that you're looking at have the visibility and the emphasis necessary. Now, we perform two different types of analysis with risk. We perform an, uh, a qualitative and a quantitative risk analysis. We'll start with the qualitative risk analysis. And yes, if you say qualitative and quantitative 16 times in a workshop, you will trip over it once or twice. Our qualitative risk analysis has inputs of the risk management plan, our scope baseline. We have our risk register. We have our enterprise environmental factors. We have our organizational process assets. Nothing surprising there. Our tools and techniques include our risk probability and impact assessment. We assess the impact and the probability of each risk, whether how likely it is to happen and what the impact would be. We have a probability and impact matrix that we talk about and use as a tool. Our risk data quality assessment we have a risk categories, which we've talked about, probably noted in the risk management plan. We have our risk urgency assessment, and that's just what it sounds like. Is there an urgency to some of this risk? Meaning there are things that are coming on a short horizon. They're closer to where we are. The possibility is closer. So that assessment, may be part of this analysis. Our expert judgment, of course, is used. We have project management updates that come out of this, and most of that project management updates have to do with the risk. Here's, here's our matrix. We're looking at a qualitative probability and impact matrix. Note, probability is the scale on the left, impact across the bottom. We have high, medium, and low. We're looking at the quality of the risk. We're looking at specifically at, is this a high quality, low quality? It's not, we're not putting numbers quite to it. 
This gives us a feel for the risk and it, we can do it quickly. As you see in the chart, high, medium, and low. And if it's a low impact and a high probability, it's a medium. And we color coded this to show that the closer you get to the upper right hand quadrant, the higher your risk, because th that's where you have a high impact and high probability. Now we haven't digitized this yet. We haven't said what does high, medium, and low mean specifically. We may have some of that in our risk management plan where we've identified terminology and tried to understand and where we're gonna use it and how we're gonna use it. Here, we're not talking about that. You would refer back if you have some specifics, but really this is not trying to wrap the numbers around it if it's not easy to. It's to try and get a feel. Why? To get some prioritization, to get some where are we gonna focus on. So here's a risk register, and we have high and low. It's the same one we looked at before, but it shows you how we put this information into here. High likelihood, low impact, severity one. Medium likelihood, low impact, et cetera, et cetera. You just start populating this. Now we move to the next kind of analysis. We've done qualitative. We get a quality of, of, of the risk and it helps us move forward because now we can look at things that we think are in higher area and we can focus our analysis on that. And here's how we do it. Our inputs include the risk management plan, our cost management plan, our schedule management plan, our risk register, our in enterprise environmental factors, and the organizational process assets. We use data gathering and representation techniques here. So we're trying to digitize, have more specific numbers to this particular set of analysis. We're looking at quantitative risk analysis and modeling techniques and expert judgment is used. Our outputs include our project document updates and that would include our risk register. So here is a probability impact matrix. We have, again, ideas on risk. I did not populate here because for this example, I wanted you to focus on the data that is here. Here we look and we have that risk identified as 33, has a probability of 20%. We've said that there is a one in five chance that this risk will manifest itself. We have an impact. If it does manifest itself, it will have an impact of $100,000. There is no day noted because there was no day that was uh, seen in the analysis, amount of days, time that it would cost us. Here, it's strictly a dollar amount that the impact re represents. And then you'll see that the reserve dollars are noted here. So this column has how much money should we put in reserve? if I have a 20% likelihood of an impact of $100,000. Well, the math is easy, that's $20,000. So we put that in the reserve column. And where the reserve column is, is right, it's reserve analysis. This is where we get some budget numbers that we can add to our baseline as maybe not guarantees that we can weather all the risks that they manifest into problems, but at least we've set aside some funds in a reasonable manner, a rational manner, and a defendable manner that's widely accepted as standard practice. The last line 38 did not have an impact in terms of dollars. It had an impact in terms of days, and we see that here. Probability of 20%, impact of 10 days. That means we want a two-day reserve. Now I know in this 
this type of, of impact analysis, you're going to say, well, if 38 happened, we don't have 10 days. Well, no, we don't. But in larger projects especially, you're not expecting all your risk to manifest. Let's hope. What you're looking for is a way of, A, looking at what might happen, the bad things and the good things, and you're trying to do some analysis so that you can plan effectively and you can tell the people approving the budget, the baseline, that we need to set aside certain amounts of days and dollars so that if we have problems, we at least have something to fall back on that we can tap into without asking you again for more money. And the level of detail that you put into this is a, something that has to do with the group you're working with, the project management team, the maturity of the organization, et cetera. There are some people who don't do this level of detail in the analysis. They f find it's a waste of money. Why do I need to discover I need a reserve of $100,000 through spending 50 for analysts to do it? I'll just give you 50 or 100 and you know not burn any more money. And that's done. Not an uncommon practice for people to have a generic 5% of their budget or 10% put in reserve in case things go wrong. Well, in case things go wrong means that risks, identified or unidentified, have manifest themselves into issues. That's what that means. The contingency reserve is the funds and days that we are basing are based on the risk analysis. Again, here is what we were talking about and that contingency reserve, based on this example, is $127,500. Other ways of looking at uh, the different tools that we use, one is this is a tornado diagram. The tornado diagram has the risks laid out and you'll see there's the positive and negative impacts and it, because it, it, is, it is diagramming these in this way, it shows them in this tornado-esque type of pattern. Tornado diagrams are not used for all, all risk analysis. It's not just a go-to. Certain risk analysis works better with tornado diagrams than other, but it's a tool. It's for your toolbox, and it, this is the way it generally looks. Next, we'll look at prioritization of risks, and here's the two things to kind of look at when you're prioritizing your risks. You need to develop the criteria for prioritization. You probably have talked about this already with your risk management plan and can be part of that, but as we're looking at d doing the analysis, we sometimes come up with ideas about the criteria that we didn't think of when we did our original uh, risk management plan and we talked our way through that. So develop the criteria for prioritization. Also, you need to develop the justifi justification for the criteria. So both are important. I need to know why I did it and I need to know why that was the why. It sounds silly, but you, the idea here is you need to be able to justify the expenditures that you're asking a company to put aside. The company will put aside a reserve of money and days based on this analysis if the analysis is good, true, and credible. In prioritizing the risks, that's what you're, you're talking about being credible. It needs to be something that's believable and it's defendable. Now we're going to plan our risk responses. Now that we know what the risks are, we prioritize them, we have our responses planned. Our risk management plan is used as an input for this process. We also have our risk register. Now we use the strategies for the negative risks or threats, the strategies for the positive risks or opportunities, 
our contingency response strategies, our expert judgment, and we come up with changes, updates to the project management plan and our project document updates happen right with this. Again, you're touching the risk register, you're touching the plans, and we plan for the strategies here of risk, in, of risk response. And there are threats, which are the negative risk, and opportunities, which are the positive risks. With negative risks, we want to avoid, if possible, it's a strategy. It's a way of looking at the risks and saying, you know, let's just avoid it. Let's not, let's not do anything that will activate that risk, make it happen. So avoid it. How do we avoid it? And we think that way. We can look at transferring it. Transferring risk is, is something we do all the time. I transfer risk every day I drive because I have insurance. And so the risk of me having an accident is transferred to my insurance company, at least partially, so that I don't have to worry about taking the burden of that accident on myself financially. We do this in projects all the time, where we have cash uh, insurance that's written against a project. I mean, you also have things uh, that the vendors have to put monies aside in case they can't fulfill their obligations. They're put into some kind of escrow account. There's various ways of doing that, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk procurement. But transferring the risk just means you push it to somebody else. You can mitigate it. That's what we hear all the time. I want to mitigate our risk, mitigate our risk, mitigate our risk. And mitigation is really talking about making sure it doesn't happen. We don't, ign we don't ignore it. We don't avoid it. We don't transfer it. We're just trying to make it less likely to happen. We're trying to put some effort into it to make it less likely to be a problem that we have to face. And the last is we just accept risk. Accepting risk is the fallback position of all risk management. If you do nothing in, about risk in your project, you have accepted it by default. Because what you're saying is, I'll accept the risk. And if anything happens, then I'll deal with it later. So acceptance of the risk and either coming up with a plan of putting money aside to a certain degree or not. But you, the idea here is that I accept things are going to go wrong. And some of them, I'm not going to try and spend money and effort to mitigate. I'm not transferring the risk. I'm not even going to try and avoid it. I'm going to face it, and if it happens, then we will face that problem uh, when, when it is in front of us, the issue when it occurs. Now, positive risks, you might want to exploit a positive risk because a positive risk is something we'd like to have happen. So you look for it. You want to exploit it. Say you have identified something that may happen with your project is that you may be able to sell beyond your, the uh, number of units. When I deploy this, instead of selling 150,000 units, I'm going to sell 1.5 million. Well, that would be great if you can predict it, but maybe... You need to, if you look at that as an opportunity, you want to exploit it. You want to have some money set aside or some plans set aside to be able to capitalize on that with triggers in place, meaning sales figures that will allow you to go with that, exploit that opportunity. So that's where opportunities work within this framework of risk because you don't want to be in a situation where you have an opportunity sitting there and you haven't thought through it. So that's why it's called a risk. You have a risk of losing money because you haven't thought through the opportunity. So just because it's a positive thing doesn't mean that it should. we, we don't look at them. Though most risk management and most risk people uh, think in terms of the risks always being bad. Here's an example where it's good and we should plan for it and try to exploit it, use that strategy. We can enhance it. 
Sometimes we enhance, we just kick it up a notch. If we see that our application is going to be very popular, we may try and make it popular for other people too. We may enhance the product line. We may push uh, another version out for another marketplace. There's lots of ways of thinking of enhancing and planning for that if we think it's justified. We might also share in that. What happens if I have a product line and I'm going to roll it out and I realize that I don't have enough stores to sell the product? Well, I might share that. I might, instead of having everybody that's selling the product being a full-time employee for my company, I might hire other companies to sell it or wholesalers to sell it or some way to be able to share with them the profitability of my product, but also uh, not lose that opportunity of making money. And that's what a lot of businesses are all about, is the making of money. And you can accept it. Opportunities can just be accepted. It is the default. And we can accept it and we can put money aside to try and do something, but it's not an active. Acceptance is not active. We don't do a lot when we accept a threat or an opportunity. Other risk components include residual risk, which is the amount of remaining after the risk response. So you've responded. And after that response, there's still some risk there. You may have to bear burden or pain. Um, when you, this is something that happens all the time. And how you would track that uh, is that you would change your risk and either eliminate the risk and, and start a new risk, which is your residual to whatever uh, level that one would analyze to. It may be very low. A lot of residual risks are moved to that low-level section in larger projects, but they're noted as what's left over after we have handled a much larger risk. You can think of it as the deductible of your insurance. If you've wrecked your car, you still may have $500 to pay the first $500 before the insurance company will kick in their side. We have secondary risk, which is the risk that occurs because of the risk response. So it's something that you've created another risk just because you have instituted a response. It could be that you've pushed off uh, or you've, you've mitigated the risk. You've re greatly reduced the, the a normal risk. Say it's the risk of having a uh, hurricane destroy your business if you are planning to open a new hardware store in Key West. Well, you decided you're going to mitigate that risk. You're going to actually, you're just going to avoid it. You're going to move your store to Kansas. Well, what you've done is you've opened a secondary risk. Well, what's that? You won't have a hurricane in Kansas, but you might have a tornado. So it's a way of framing that every solution might have a bit of risk associated with it. So we need to look for our secondary risks after we've mitigated, responded to our primary risk. We also have workarounds, unplanned responses to newly emerging risks. That means when something happens and you are just, you haven't had a chance to analyze it, maybe put a response into place, if the, if, if, this risk is really pushing to be a, an issue, a workaround could be just to avoid, try and avoid it in a sense, but it's not as formalized. You haven't gone through a process, you haven't looked at it in the complete qualitative and quantitative analysis modes, but you just see something is possible. The workaround is the, is the short-term fix, if you will, or look at, and then something more formalized can happen later. The risk owner is the person that owns the response. So your owner is typically the res person that owns the response if the risk is manifested into an issue. Another technique, the, the Monte Carlo simulation is, is a, 
a way of using software and it statistically samples a predicted project's behavior. Note this one because it's statistically sampling and it generally is something that's talked about when we certify. It's a, a, a component and usually a question is asked about it. The keys here uh, is that it's primarily used in scheduling because we're trying to look at a project schedule, usually with a lot of data points, meaning a lot of moving parts in within a project. So it's a fairly extensive and lengthy project. And it allows us to go do a what if sampling. What if we go this way? What if we go that way? What if we start this early? What if we start this one later? How, what would happen to the overall schedule and how that affects the budget and the overall possible success. But it does it by using more sophisticated statistical sampling to be able to arrive at those questions. So it's a software process that's, that's well known and, and used, but in a, I would say a small group of industries, companies, um, large enough and they spend enough money so that it is significant, but it's not something that the average project manager that I've worked with over 20 odd years has ever used in any real sense. It's something to be aware of because you can use similar techniques, just not as elaborate as what this software will do. Now, implementing risk responses is a new process to this version. We, it, it was added in by large amount because project managers like myself said, well, we're planned, but we don't talk about a process to actually implement the responses. And so we did, we added this to implement. The inputs are your standard project management plan, risk register, the work performance data, uh, work performance reports. We use our risk assessment as, as our tool and our risk audits uh, trends and, and, and variance and trends analysis. We also use any other data that we have, measurements that we're seeing, and the response plan. We use the, the, the tools reserve that we know about because there we're, we're talking about how, do we have money set aside, do we have days set aside, the outputs, well of course meetings, our outputs include work performance information. It, it includes our, any change requests. Because we're implementing a response, we may need to alter the project. Even though there may be reserve funds, it may take a change request to actually implement the use of those funds or those days because the, it, it may be embedded within the uh, baseline budget, but it doesn't mean that it's easily accessible. So a change request may be needed, but implementing the, the risk responses is an important process that's, like I said, is new. Some of the inputs, outputs, tools, and techniques that are in this may alter slightly when the final version is, is published, but I'm noting it here because it is an important step and it is a, a new and I think a, a great improvement to this version. And of course we have our management project management plan updates, and our project document updates as well. And, if, and the organizational process assets are sometimes updated because of the need to be able to understand the ongoing um, process adjustments that this response may offer up. Now we control the risk. Controlling risk inputs are our project management plan, our risk register, our work performance data, our work performance reports. We use our risk assessment, our risk audits. So we're checking to see if any risks have hit a trigger. That's the kind of thing we would audit. We're looking at variance and trend analysis technical performance measurements, if we're prototyping or bringing out versions, especially when we're talking about iterative processes with Agile and, and Scrum and such, there may be some performance measurements that we're able to get earlier as we roll things to production 
and we do another iteration of the software or the product line. We also use our reserve analysis that we've, we've done before. And of course we meet with people because we're trying to make sure the risks are controlled, understood, we can go back and change things, which is what we're talking here. We have the information from the work performance information. We got the data as an input, we give information out. We have change requests, always a possibility. Our project management plan updates, our project document updates, our organizational process asset updates. Now, here again is the risk register. We are looking at that because this is our fundamental document that we look at every time we're dealing with risk. Now, we've planned everything, but now we're controlling. So the, the idea here is as we move through the project, early on it's heavily into planning, then we're, we're when we get through planning and, and analysis and we have the responses in place, then the controlling, monitoring and controlling would look back at this, validate that this is still accurate and that nothing else has changed, and just keep an eye on things. So this is our risk management, our knowledge area in risk. Several processes within this and there's a lot of moving parts at time. It's sometimes thought to be very burdensome. In fact, there are programs and project management offices that will create specialized roles just for risk managers, and they will oversee the risk component of a program or a project or a portfolio. So it realize it is a very specialized area in some ways, but it is not terribly difficult to understand the concepts behind it nor the reasoning that it's necessary. Our review, key terms. Risk register, know what that is and how it's used. Our qualitative risk analysis, our quantitative risk analysis, our risk response, our triggers, risk tolerance, the tornado diagram, SWOT analysis, all important terms.